All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Breaking Absolutes. Um, I'm Peter Arulian. I'm really excited today to get to talk to Brittany Hayes, uh, also known as Brittany Slays, sings for Unleash the Archers. Um, I've been a fan of Brittany's for quite some time, and um, you know I have a bias uh, to, uh, for vocalists, and um, Brittany, I think, um, has established herself, in my mind anyway, as one of the premier vocalists in the rock and metal scene. Um, and I want to talk to her about some of her technique as well as some of the music. Um, but just uh, to set it up a little bit, um, um, you know, there's there's these things that go around the internet where they start to to list out vocalists and and fans um, will will vote. Britney shows up in these lists quite regularly, um, which I think is a nod from the community, which is a pretty strong endorsement because those are the actual fans who are listening. Um, the band has has a reputation for being um, uh, very accessible and approachable. The band has um, toured like, like they one of those journeyman bands who's really done the work on the road. Had some successful independent releases before being picked up by Napalm. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that with her. Um, there's uh, their their album. There are probably other chart positions, but at the very least, with the the record Apex, there are a number of chart positions. And as I've said before on the show, that's not the end all, beat all, but it's a data point that also suggests sort of industry awareness of the the band and their music. Um, so I want to note that, and we'll we'll include pointers to where you can go and you can kind of see some of the um, legitimized success, I guess, from the the industry of the group. Um, but let me go ahead before just rambling on and bring Brittany on, and we'll just have the conversation with her. Brittany, welcome. Hi. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? Good. Hey, that's a really cool poster you've got behind you. Oh, thank you. Is that you. like a banner? Like a Wrong way. <laughs> yeah, that's the flag from uh, our Explorers EP. Yeah. yeah, I actually wanted to talk about that later. That's a really cool project you guys did. Um. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to tell you, it's interesting. I had a, a buddy, I, I every once in a while, just for kicks, I'll, I'll do the thing on social media where I kind of ask people for favorites. And I, I asked for, for female vocal favorites. And I had a guy, and this has been years ago now, but he, he shot me a link to um, your Tonight We Ride. And um, my jaw dropped. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it, was a, a, it was a stunning, I mean, and there, there was so much more to uncover. But it was kind of a revelation um, it, it, uh, to hear your voice. Um, and I want to talk about how, how you're blending it with the music. But I wanted to ask, first off, because we have a lot of musicians that follow the channel, is this, um, is this sort of vocal ability something you come by entirely naturally and self-taught, or did you do any sort of formal training? Uh, nothing formal, no. But I have been singing my whole life. I started in choir when I was eight years old. So I got a lot of training there and I went to the UVic School of Music. I didn't graduate with a degree in music, but I took a, as many classes as I could without being um, a music major. And I learned a lot there as well. And it was, uh, you know, mostly about how to control your voice, how to use your body to, you know, to the best of your ability and how to become a stronger and more powerful vocalist. So it was... You know, it was pretty eye opening learning, uh, you know, everything that I did when I was in university. So um, I was mostly classical trained. Uh, that's where whenever I took lessons, it was always on the classical side of things. And so I took a few here and there, that kind of thing. But nothing never like with one vocal coach for years on end or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and then when I started the band, I was kind of like, OK, now I need to learn how to be a metal singer because I'd been doing chamber music my whole life. So it was a bit of a learning curve, but oh. um, just listened to the greats and kind of emulated what I liked and tried to make it my own. So um, before I ask my next question, you said chamber music. So like, is there any of this that we could hear someplace? The, ch the more, f the more, I don't know, classical stuff. Um, well, I mean, there's some, like choir recordings from ages ago, but I don't know where you would find where we'd them. We'd find them, yeah. That's just intriguing did, to me. I did. Um, uh, I did a song with Ty from Lords of the Trident, who's also a very, very powerful vocalist, and we did the song Brindisi together. So that's on YouTube. 
if okay. you want to hear my my classical voice. <laughs> classical voice. Well, the um, during the COVID, I mean, it's still going, of course, but in the early days when I personally started to feel some of the fatigue, I called up a couple of friends that are um, musicians and and in, into the into metal, and we started we started a conversation and. Um, I brought you up and I, the, what I find interesting and unique about your voice is you've got the, you've got, you can, you can, there's a, a sense of, in it of the classical. There's, you know, the, the deep um, oscillating vibrato and, and the power and the range and all of that. But you, you have this um, unique ability to introduce like an, an edge. There's an edge in your voice that, that, really, really drives it with the music that you guys, it's not, and it's not simply that you can introduce some grit and some rasp. That's one thing, but there's a, there's a quality to your voice. And I, 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 I don't know if it's just a, a blessing for you or if you've cultivated that, but it, um, it marries really well with your music and it gives your voice a strength, uh, in, even compared to other female metal vocalists. Um, it's, I guess that's not a question. It's more of a compliment. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I, it's not something that just comes naturally. You know, you have to work on it. And, um, and some people have to work on tone more than others, for sure. But um, yeah, I, I, I kind of set my mind to it uh, in the very beginning, you know, that I wanted to I wanted to sound different from the other female vocalists out there. And so I worked very hard in order to do that and developed my voice. And it's changed a lot. You can hear it from the old records yeah. compared to the new records, just how much I've grown. And a lot of that is also experience in the studio and learning how to be able to do what I do live in a little box with no one else around. So <laughs> that, that adds something to do with it. But um, I definitely have learned so much about what I can do just by really experimenting and playing around with things and um, just like, certain vowel sounds and things like that and kind of you know okay i need to stay away from doing that because i sound really screechy you know that kind of thing and never yeah. do a a high wail on e you know that kind of stuff so <laughs> it, it's just you know things that you learn over time yeah no you make a really good point there that those restrictive vowels are, are not only tough to sing but they don't always sound great when you get up in the range mm -hmm. um it's so it's really it's really um it's really cool to hear you talk about that sort of consciousness about your voice and, and uh, vocalizing. Um, I want to, I want to go back to where you started. So you, you, you weren't originally from Vancouver area, but you moved there. Was that, was that, was that university or did you need to get someplace where you thought you could put the band together? Yeah, I had grown up in a suburb of Vancouver, so I okay. ha I knew it very well, but I went to university in Victoria, which is a small town on Vancouver Island, which is um, one of the largest islands in North America, but it's uh, very much a small town. It's got a big city mentality, but uh, because it's a university town, right? Big university towns tend to be like that. Um, so I went to school there and then lived there for a few years after finishing university. And we started the band when we were there. Um, and we kind of got to this point where we couldn't get where we wanted to go by continuing to live in this small town. Yeah. Um, so that was when we all decided, we, you know, made the decision as a band to move over to Vancouver and give it a shot. And pretty quickly after that, we lost a couple of our original uh, members. So, it, you know, it wasn't for everyone, but we felt that it was the right decision because we, you know, we knew immediately that the opportunities were greater over there because we started, you know, seeing these huge tours coming through and it's like, oh man, like, you know, we could open for this band or this band, like what the heck we've been, you know, getting nothing but pittance over there on the island. So, um, and also the ferry is extremely expensive. So when you've got an overheight van and an over length trailer, you know, you're paying, <laughs> paying out the wahoo for it. So we were kind of like, it would be really nice to have a guarantee and not have the whole thing go to the ferry. Yeah. So that, that was why we did it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm from Seattle, so I've been to Victoria. It's beautiful up there. Um, it really is, yeah. It really is. And um, Bouchard Gardens is not too far from there, right? Yeah, it's like a 20-minute drive. If, if I'm saying that right. I've been there. Um, and I've, of course, been across the border to Vancouver many times, sometimes to see to see shows if for some reason the tour routing doesn't take it through here. So what you're 
saying makes a ton of sense to me. After you founded the band, um, and when you guys started to get on the road, um, you did build this reputation for um, like doing a lot of touring, um, and you've got a very athletic regimen that you sing. So I have, I have kind of two questions there. Is um, did you guys kind of make the conscious decision we're going to go earn our stripes, or did it, or was like it just a necessity to get out and play as much as you did? And then how how have you kept your voice healthy to sing this kind of material night after night? Uh, yeah, well, for the first question, yes, it was definitely a conscious decision. We said, you know, how are we going to get noticed? How are we going to grow our fan base? How do you, uh, you know, just um, be recognized outside of your hometown? And the only way to do that is is to tour. And especially back when we started, where it was only my space was the only thing right. in existence. And so um, we were kind of like, oh, this is cool. Like, what a neat new place to post your music and pretty quick after like youtube and, and facebook came around but um yeah at the time it was still the old school way of doing things you know we would mail demos to the labels when we were ready to shop a record and uh the only way to get noticed is to play in a town and have a label a and r show up you know so it was just like kate we need to get out there and also you know when you're in the market for an agent a booking agent you got to prove that you could tour. They're not going to sign someone that's like, oh, touring's too expensive. You know, like they want someone that's going to get out there and do it. Yeah. And you, the only way to prove that is by, yeah, living like shit on ramen all day long in a van for six weeks. Like, yeah. but that was, that was the, that was the way it had to be done. So we did it and we worked really hard to first gain, gain a huge fan base across Canada, just ripping over to, Halifax and back once a year and we played Western Canada like a shit ton and uh, finally when I got the visas figured out <laughs> we started playing the states and um, and just playing to five people and then to 50 people and then now you know we're selling out 500 person venues so it's just a matter of yeah you gotta you gotta put the time in and if you're not willing to do the work to do that labels notice and booking agents notice and management notice. So yeah. the only way to really, you know, to prove you're worth it, worth the investment is to put the work in. Um, and as for <laughs> taking care of my voice, I just, you know, you really learn how to do things that, um, and do them in such a way that are not going to destroy your vocals every night. So sometimes I'm listening to a record or to a band live and I'm going, Ooh, they're going to be gone by the end of the tour. You know, just so you can feel it. You can yeah. see it when they perform and you can hear it. So you just got to, that's one part about you know, like what I mentioned before is you really got to know your body and you got to know how to make these sounds without destroying your body and how to make it happen in a comfortable manner and in a way that you can do it over and over and over again. And it takes me a long time to get in, in show shape, like tour shape. I can't do what we do just off the cuff when we haven't been touring, you know, or, or jamming for weeks on end. So, um, you know, I don't want people to think that I just you know, hop out my chair and, and like wailing and, and, you know, motorbiking all over the place. It's just not, not the case. Yeah. I have to really work at it and um, kind of ramp myself up to the point where it's like, okay, yeah, I'm ready to do this every night. And then it just gets better every single night. The more you sing by the end of it, I'm like, oh, I don't even have to warm up anymore. This is so fantastic. You know, um, there was a comment one time of someone that watched us on our Europe tour and uh, they had gone to like a show in Germany and then they saw our last show in Scotland at the end and they were just like, I can't honestly believe it, but she sounds better on the last day of tour than she did uh, on one of her first shows that she did. And it's totally true because if you're doing it right, then your voice loves it and is, you know, ready to go. And if you're not doing it, then that's when you have vocal vocal issues. Yeah. So it sounds like it sounds like you don't necessarily have like a, a rote warm up. Um, you kind of build into your tour stamina and then that just increases with use. Yeah. So, I mean, I do warm up. Absolutely. Okay. Especially in the, at the beginning of, of a tour, I'm, I'm in the back room for at least an hour and the boys want to murder me, but um, 
it's important that you, yeah, you, some vocalists like to use the first song as their warm up, and I'm definitely not that person. So I, uh, I you know, I always warm up at the, but I'm just saying that because um, when we're jamming, we're jamming like three or four nights a week. So you have to really warm up to make sure that you get into that place where you can, um, where you can, you know, push out an hour long set every night. But then as the tour goes along and you're playing every single night, your voice eventually just gets into this place where it's kind of always warmed up. It's really weird. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I completely understand what you're talking about. Um, but it's, it's that all of that said, it's still really impressive because, um, uh, while there are songs that are that um, don't always go clear up into your range and have all the athleticism, much of it does. So it's still it's still an impressive achievement to be able to go and do that um, to sing the material. And I'm not the only one that thinks that, but I just wanted to say it out loud. Uh, your your first couple of records are were independently released, um, and w one of the things I, I have a bias towards I just love is I I love music that decides to sort of tell a story that there's a narrative motion to it. And your second record had that, right? It was a concept record. Um, yep. The demons of the Astro waste. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You take these science fiction themes, which is cool. I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of uh, fantasy and science fiction. And of course, a lot of power metal and progressive metal um, uses that genre. Um, are, when, when you get to this kind of, of music where you're telling a story is that, is that, are you like the crafter of the story? Is that a collaborative effort with the group? Uh, no, yeah, it's, it's, it's all me. I do all the lyrics and, and everything like that. So the story definitely comes from um, <clears throat> my imagination for the most part. Uh, Demons of the Astro Waste, I did write in tandem with Brayden. So he would come with a riff and he would say, you know, what do you think of this? And I'd be like, oh yeah, that sounds like, I don't know, like a battle riff. They're marching into battle. I was like, let's write a song about a battle. And he'd be like, okay, cool. And then maybe, maybe there's like a, a, a leader in the battle and he's like all clad in black. And I'd be like, yeah, cool. Let's talk <laughs> about that. You know, like there was a little bit of back and forth thing there um, just because demons was my first one. And I kind of didn't really understand what should go into a concept record at the time. <laughs> um <clears throat> But Apex and Abyss, I definitely wrote the whole story and like handed it to the boys and said, here you go. This is what I was hoping it would sound like. And I had a track by track for them for every song and saying, you know, this is what's happening in the story. This is how I want the listener to feel. This is the song that's in kind of inspired, inspiring it. You know, um, think of this band, you know, when I'm talking riffage or that kind of thing. And then I'd say like, and it should be like really heavy and fast or, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then the boys, the boys wrote around that. So it was, um, yeah, that's really written. Yeah. That's really useful. Uh, um, I know that there are times that concept albums kind of come together when music's written and then, uh, you know, the lyricist and, or the, and, or the vocalist superimpose something. But your yeah. the, the latter two records you just described, which I think I read was uh, originally there, it might have been a double album uh, mm -hmm. plan. They they there's a cohesiveness to the storytelling, which I really admire because this is an area of music I love so much. Mm -hmm. um, so I can uh, so hearing you talk about it, um, it makes sense to me that that that's how it came about because um, there was some sort there was like a narrative base to it uh, going in. So kudos, are you a science fiction fantasy nerd? You like that stuff? Oh, yes. Yeah, for sure. You, you can't really see it, but my shelf is full of comic books and, and there's The Witcher and uh, lots of, yeah, everything. It's all it's all science fiction and fantasy. That's my favorite. And I've managed to get Scott into it as well. So he's reading a lot of stuff. And I've read a lot of things that he hasn't read yet. And he's read a lot of things that I haven't read yet. And so our our bookshelf is has got a lot of TBRs on it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, let's take one small diversion there. Um, um, the other side of my life, I'm actually a fantasy and science fiction writer. And so I have oh, to nice. I have to know, give me a couple of your favorites in the genre that you like, writers. Um, Joe Abercrombie oh, is yeah. fantastic. Glenn Cook is really good. Alistair Reynolds on the science fiction side of things. Um, oh, there's too many. <laughs> uh, Joe and Frank Glenn. Herbert. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> For sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, the the, the first, those first couple. Uh, uh, Glenn was kind of the the first great practitioner of grimdark, which is a uh, a subgenre yeah. of fantasy. He kind of paved the way. Yeah, he, yeah. He did. He did Black Company and that stuff. Yeah. Um, and Joe, I met Joe. Uh, I got to go to dinner with him when he came through Seattle on tour. He's the funniest guy. Like he writes this like really, really gritty fantasy, yeah. but he's so comical in person. Yeah. No, he, and he knows how to like, he just puts the lightest touches into his writing and they always land. And it's just, yeah, he's actually like one of the, you know, one of my favorite writers to have discovered in the last few years here. So yeah, um, yeah I gobbled down everything he had to offer. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's fun to hear your your taste there because that's a side of my life I don't get to talk about too much on this uh, on this show. Um, so that, have a, a second one. <laughs> yeah, maybe I shouldn't talk about all of that stuff. I'm doing I'm currently totally. doing a collaboration with a, a writer by the name of Brandon Sanderson. He writes a lot of epic fantasy. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the the. the <laughs> I love thing. how you just say that like. Like no one knows who Brandon Sanderson is. <laughs> well, I don't like to assume he he's a very popular writer, uh, but yeah, yes. he, he and I are collaborating on a, a contemporary fantasy thing where the leads the lead character is a metal singer. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, he, awesome. He tapped me for that because I'm a metal singer and uh, and and a writer, so it's been a lot of fun to to do that. Uh, but let's not digress too much. Can, maybe you can rope him in. Don't don't let him wander. He tends to wander sometimes. He, he writes. The, his <laughs> books are so big, like the that Stormlight <laughs> Archive. Like, he just it, it. He he'll send me a note. This, this book's four hundred and fifty thousand words. That's like five books for most writers. You know? Yeah. It's yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So um, it's fun to hear. It's fun to hear some of your taste there. And and it, it um to bring it back to music, uh, it's certainly it's cool to, that you're, that's informing some of the the storytelling you're doing um in the in the with the albums i love it um so we'll we'll for people that don't know you many do that are that follow this show but we'll make sure we kind of point people to um all of it of course but we'll call out those those records um before we talk a little bit more about those though the your first napalm record was time stands still and that was the the um that was the first one where you'd lost a, a central songwriter yeah yeah, uh, Brayden was on a little bit of it. Some of the okay. tracks were, it was kind of an in-between time record for okay. us. So um, Brayden had uh, writing credits on three of the tracks and then Andrew had writing credits on the rest of them. And um, <clears throat> so it was our first record with, a, a yeah, basically a new kind of force behind things. Grant does writing, um, some of the writing as well, but it was always, Brayden was kind of the, the main driver and then Andy just kind of moved in and took over that role and continued to work with Grant in the same way, you know, here's a riff, there's a riff, that kind of thing and back yeah. and forth. So I think it was a pretty big change on that record, um, but not not quite as huge as Apex, which is where it was full on Andy, kind of the driving force behind things. And then even more so because Grant wrote a few tracks on apex as well and then abyss was just straight up andy he wrote everything so we've kind of had this like progression of you, you know musicality and and change in, in songwriting style since we signed with napalm yeah yeah well so how did um let's talk just a little bit about that so you crafted this story that originally looked like it was going to be a, a double album but then you released just the first record um, but then you talked just just a moment ago. You talked about sort of this sort of songwriting growth. Did you did you um, kind of was that second part of that story different sonically because of the growth, or was it still really rooted in the, the narrative that you that you had in terms of like the the, the feel you wanted with the songs and stuff? Yeah, well, we had um, started writing Apex and Abyss, and I knew right away that it was going to be two albums. And we were thinking like, ooh, let's do like a, a double disc thing. Like, I was definitely inspired by uh, The Living Infinite by Soil Work. And I was like, oh, that's such a great record, you know, like, would love to do something like that. But we just honestly didn't have the time. We didn't have the money for the studio um, to be in there that long and that kind of thing. So then it was just kind of like, okay, let's chop put Abyss aside for now. And we just focused on writing for Apex. So there was maybe like three riffs 
three okay. singular riffs that were written for Abyss when we were writing for Apex. So it, it was very much two different times in our lives. And you can tell big time because uh, in between Apex and Abyss, we discovered Synthwave. <laughs> <laughs> and so obviously we were like, well, we're putting a synth on the new record. And that was totally, you know, I was just kind of like, man, it's set in space and it's a super science fiction record versus Apex, which I wanted to be very fantasy-esque. Uh, and so I, I knew that the two stories were going to be quite different. Um, and Apex is very much a darker record. And it's kind of about our main character when he's in this very, you know, dark space where he kind of, he, he hopes, but he, he has no hope for the future, really. And then Abyss, where it's all of a sudden he's handed a, a lifesaver, basically, um, from... Uh, another character and he kind of is like oh crap I might just get out of this thing you know and so it's a very it's a bright and happy record so the synth really helped with that but also yeah it was very much about infusing the emotion and the what's going on in the story with the songs uh, so that that's why I sent the tracks to the boys beforehand and said look this is the part where he's really in a bad spot and he, he doesn't know what to do like i want the song to reflect that apprehension and uh, you know i want the listener to feel the the agony you know what i mean and and so it was like that with all of the songs and the boys would come with a riff and they'd be like how about this one for like the matriarch song and i like cleanse the bloodlines was one that andrew wrote when he was away on vacation and he came back and he's like brit i got the riff <laughs> I got it because Cleanse is the only track from the matriarch, her who's our antagonist, from her point of view on Apex. And he's like, oh, man, this has got the matriarch written all over it. And he was right. It, it was perfect. So there were times, you know, like that. And then there were times where they'd send me something and I'd be like, no, let's try again. You know, yeah. or it could could be, but let's do this or that or faster or, you know, take out this part or that kind of thing. Um, because it was just super important that the song reflect the story because it's, I didn't want it to, to be disconnected. I didn't want it to feel like I had just thrown lyrics over a, you know, an album that someone had written. It was, it was super important to me that they felt like one and the same. Yeah. Well, um, you succeeded at that. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the, you know, I, I mean, this is my opinion, but I have spent considerable time um, on this very topic. The folks who follow the show know one of the things I did, I novelized Dream Theater's Astonishing Record, and I worked very closely with John on that. So I, I, have a, a, I think I've got a really good objective, strong sense about narrative with music. And so when I listen to these records, um, and I hear you, well, I know you're, now I know you're a science fiction and fantasy fan, but um, I hear that the sort of direction and product, pr the producer role you took with these to sort of get it right, um, it paid dividends. It was successful there. Um, and it's also just cool for me to know that there are mu musicians who are still thoughtful in this approach because it's not always mm -hmm. the case. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a, there's a, a one, and one nod to that is the, the track Afterlife has got actual orchestrations in it. Was that a new thing for you guys? Yeah, yeah. Andy did it on his his uh, Pro Tools, wrote everything with his little, I don't even know how he does it. It's pretty, pretty crazy. And uh, and we sent that off to, to Jacob and he was like, oh, you know what? This sounds good. He's like, but I have someone that can make it sound better. And he sent it to Paolo from Flesh God Apocalypse, who then took basically like the midis and put them into his plugins which are incredible yeah. and sound like a real orchestra and uh, and he sent new tracks and said here you go except for the ocarina um the sort of the main flute melody there Andy wrote that and was really attached to it so we kept that part but everything else is all francesco from um francesco farini farini there's two francescos in flesh god um from flesh god apocalypse who does all their stuff yeah yeah yeah, it, it gives it a dimension. And it's this the whole, I mean, you, you talked about the, the synth inclusion. Um, there's a there's a growth in the music with these additions. And I don't know that they're, is this suggestive of, of um, like permanent, 
like a permanent way you guys will continue to to yeah. write and arrange or was this was this unique to this particular project yeah i think we'll probably continue to do that um i really like having stories in the albums that i write uh when you know when i first first heard that concept records were a thing i i, I listened to crucible of man by iced earth and i was like wait a minute they did what this whole thing is one story one story throughout I was like well I'm never writing anything else <laughs> you know because I've always been a writer and I just love reading and and telling stories and all that sort of stuff and um with our record behold the devastation it was really just a selection of stories so it was eight tracks and each one was its own kind of thing very much like Bruce Dickinson or um, Rob Halford, how they write their songs, you know, each yeah. track is a, is a little adventure into some creatures life or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. So that's what behold was. But when I learned about concept albums, I was like, Oh shit, I got to do that. And so I tried it with demons and I mean, it was all right. Um, and then I, you know, have been seeking to perfect it since then. So I'll probably continue to write that way. It might not be as intense as Apex and Abyss were, but uh, definitely always a unifying factor, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're good at it. Um, so, uh, you <laughs> know, you. you can certainly you can do you get great examples of when it can be done in a song and sort of be a vignette. Um, it's it, there's a lot more work in the, the kind of thing you did with Apex and Abyss. So, but you've got a long career ahead of you, so you'll have all kinds of time to do uh, different kinds of storytelling. Um, so. There's one, there's one sort of bonus track on uh, Apex. You did a cover of Queen of the Reich, uh, which is stellar. Like, uh, you know, I grew up. Thank you. In fact, the reason I moved to Seattle was to train with the same guy that trained Jeff because I was so taken with his voice. And oh, yeah. Um, you, you nailed it, but I was in, in preparation for this conversation, I went and just was looking you up on YouTube. You did a karaoke version of this <laughs> and it was, it, you could have put that on a record. Like it was that, <laughs> that was that good. There weren't, there were no misses. Uh, it was, it was really impressive when you see someone, a, a vocalist like yourself out in the wild vocalizing, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that's a, that's kind of a, that's a real test case right there so i wanted to give you some props for that because that's a Thank that's you. not an easy song to sing and it, yeah no it's one of my favorites from them for sure jeff tate was one of the ones that i listened to when when we first started the band and i was like i need to sound like that i was like how does he do those mid-range falsettos like that where is he putting that in his mouth you know like where's the placement to sound like that and that's definitely where i get a lot of my technique from is from him yeah. So, and, and his expression, oh man, I had to work so hard for years to figure out how to be so expressive and so emotional in the studio to have it come across the way that he can, you know, bring it across that just, it's, it's magical. Yeah. So yeah. Huge influence for me. Yeah. Well, he, and you can hear it. I mean, your voice is unique, but you can hear the, the echoes of Tate in terms of the, the, I call it the roundness. Like there's a fullness in your mm. voice that doesn't always exist in someone who may have the same range. Um, and so, you know, that's, I have a bias towards athletic singing and singers who, who test themselves and do this kind of music. So that's, it's one of the reasons, frankly, I was really eager to talk to you because um, <laughs> I think you're, I think you're really op hitting on all cylinders and yes, you know, you've gotten better. I think you were really good from the beginning, but your voice has matured. Your technique has matured, um, which brings me to a question around future work. Um, I know we've kind of, everybody's kind of been sitting on their hands for the last 18 months, but are, have you guys done any thinking about the next thing? Um, a little bit. Yeah. We've kind of been talking about it. Uh, we released Abyss during the pandemic, of course, as you know. So there was a lot of work involved with that. And then we've just kind of been waiting for the touring to get back together so that we can we can tour uh, the in support of the record and play all those new songs live for everyone. So we didn't want to put out something new until we had had the chance to yeah. kind of let Abyss run its course. So once we finish all the touring that we have planned for that, 
then we'll get get back to work. <laughs> but are there, there's, um, just a, there's some ideas right now, but nothing really solid. Uh, speaking of touring, uh, is there, uh, I didn't see this, but I may have missed it. Do you, is there anything concrete, anything, um, dates that yep. people can look to? Yep. If you head to unleashtheArchers.com, we've got all our tour dates there. We're doing the U.S. in September. Oh, wait a minute. And I'm, I'm lying. I did see that. I did see that because I saw that you're coming through Seattle. I get to come see. I've never seen you guys live. Uh, oh, nice. So that's a stupid question on my part. Um, <laughs> no, no worries. I'm always down to to so tell all the tours. <laughs> yeah. So you're coming. Tell us. You started, but I interrupted you. Keep going. You, you're coming through the U.S. Oh, no, for no, sure. No. Yep, U.S. in September, and then we're doing some Canadian dates in October slash November, and then we're doing Europe in November, December, hopefully, if everyone can clean up their act over there in time for it. Um, and then, yeah, uh, we're doing two festivals in Europe in like two weeks. So Alcatraz in Belgium and Dynamo in the Netherlands, and then we'll fly back from those um have a little tiny little time off in between and then and then hit the road in the u.s yeah. so the u.s states are already starting to sell out so if you haven't got your tickets yet definitely do it yeah we'll we'll put a pointer up to your website for sure and encourage people to look um i think you're playing a club called el, el corazon here locally yes yes so me and <laughs> we a bunch know of, it well <laughs> <laughs> me and a bunch of friends will uh be sure we're there and cheering you on awesome um <laughs> thank you I, I noted that, uh, kind of just backtracking real quick, because I saw a note I made, you guys are th considering doing a graphic novel related mm -hmm. to the, the concept records. Is that a for sure thing? I mean, yes, in my mind it is. It's just finding the time to do it. Yeah. I've got like the first four chapters pretty much written for it. Um, I've got an artist on board who is really stoked to work on it. And it's literally just finding the time. I'm hoping that I'll be able to work on it on the road. There's a lot of downtime on the road. So hoping that I'll be able to, I was really wanting it to be done before the end of the year, at least in PDF for everyone to read, right? If not printed. So um, yeah, I gotta get, I gotta light a fire under my butt on that one. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, I've got ideas, graphic novels for Apex and Abyss and then a uh, sort of a prologue and then an epilogue and then kind of a middle one to talk about what happens in between um, the time that passes between apex and abyss. Wow. That's really, really cool. That's um, I'm excited. I didn't, I mean, I knew you wrote about the lyrics and you did the sort of conceit for the records. I didn't know you were actually writer, writer. That's really cool. I mean, doing the, we, we did an earbook, which was um, a limited edition thing when we released abyss and it it was really quick it was actually very difficult to, to condense the stories into one page uh, paragraphs so that we could not spend a million dollars on <laughs> on yeah. this yearbook um so i have basically the whole album in chapters um in in the yearbook and i think it's on someone um did a whole like read through of it on youtube if you oh if very you cool go. Yeah, go listen to it. But it's really condensed. But it, yeah, I wrote kind of I wrote the the general gist of Abyss in story like format um, as as well as I could in such a <laughs> squished amount of space. I would definitely take a look at that. And I'll um, I'll just keep my my eyes out and we'll encourage others to do the same for the graphic novels when you can get some time. Um, so I, I wanted to before just a couple more questions and I'll leave you to your evening, but we, you had mentioned, I, I don't know if it was, I think it was at the top of the, the show, um, your record Northwest passage, um, the EP. Um, what yep. was the, what was the, the impetus for that? Like, how did you come by mm -hmm. wanting to do some of that with the covers and stuff? So we love Stan Rogers. He is a local, um, folk hero basically in Canada um, and he he wrote the song uh, Northwest Passage and we play his music when we're on tour all the time and um, we love singing that song and whenever it comes on we always we're all belting it out so we knew we wanted to do a cover of Northwest Passage so we said okay let's make it the bonus track for Apex 
So we went into the studio and we recorded Northwest Passage and we got it back from Jacob and we were just like, okay, this cannot be a bonus track that gets hidden away and, you know, heard only by those that ordered the CD version in Japan. You know, it's, yeah. um, it's got to be something special. It's got to get its own, own, um, you know, treatment. So we put that aside. We did Queen of the Reich instead really quickly <laughs> and, um, and saved Northwest Passage for when, you know, we're like, okay, we'll just hold on to it until there's a little bit of downtime when we got nothing going on. And then our A&R at Napalm at the time said, well, why don't you do a second track and we'll do like an AB on a seven inch. And so we were kind of like, okay, cool. <laughs> now what, what the heck do we do for the second song? Um, and I discovered Tease a, a few months prior to her suggesting this. So I was like, oh, let's do Heartless, Heartless World. I was like, they're Canadian. The whole thing is, is very much in the same sort of tone and emotion as Northwest Passage. I was like, let's do it. And the boys are kind of like, eh, nah, nah, nah. and then it got to, down to game time. And it's like, we need to do something. And I basically was just like, we're doing Heartless World. And they were like, okay. Um, so we put that out and um, did the most hilariously convoluted and complex music video for Northwest Passage. But the song did really well. And it's like our most listened to track on Spotify because so many people know Stan Rogers and know that song and feel really strongly about it. Because it's we call it the second Canadian national anthem because it really is. Um, it's about traversing the Northwest Passage and how Stan used to feel like an explorer from the old days when he would be on tour, when he'd be driving the highways and stuff like that. And um, talking about how he's like, I'm, I'm forging my own Northwest Passage through Canada and that kind of thing. So it's really, it, it means a lot to us and, you know, to, to a lot of Canadians out there. So it just, it, it did really well and we put a lot of heart into it. So. Uh, yeah and i miss i misspoke before because the ep is called explorers is that right yeah and i i called the ep um northwest passage which is the track you've just been describing um right. so that yeah that's really good i i appreciate the backstory on that i um i i knew the song but uh, i love your rendition of it as um really creative uh i actually watched it um just this morning um couple of notes I just want to call out for folks who may be less familiar with Unleash the Archers. The, one of the more recent tracks, at least that I uh, listened to, was um, Soulbound. And you just start this thing kind of throwing down the vocal gauntlet. <laughs> there's, a, there's an initial thing. You kind of set the table with this, a really, really great scream. And then you, just, then you take a breath and you, uh, you just go into this stratosphere. It is, um, it's a, it's, it's like a vocal, I don't know. It's like a, it's, it's this her vocal hero moment. Like, um, <laughs> are you, are you conscious that you're kind of doing these athletic things? Um, or, you know, or is this just like, Hey, this is what the song requires right now. I just honestly was trying to think of something new. <laughs> I've done like that opening whale so many times. Yeah. Um, that I just wanted to try something else basically. Yeah. So it was, um, it was kind of like, okay, I've never done this layered thing before. I was like, well, why don't we do that? <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's really just about experimenting and trying to see if I can come up with something that I haven't done yet. I'm like, okay, I went low and then high before. How, how about I go high and then low? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what else can I do? How many times? And like, sometimes the song just really calls for like that opening wail and you just can't not. Yeah. And now it would get to the point where, you know, our fans would hear a new song and they would expect it. And then I wouldn't do it because it's like, ah, I've done it so many times. I, I, I think that would just be disappointing. So, yeah. Well, you know, there you, vocalists and, and, bands get have they create calling cards um and because of the vocal instrument you have you've created some of those for yourself um <laughs> and for, so and fans of the music and certainly um vocalists and not just myself a community of vocalists that i know love to listen to you sing just because of that so don't stop doing the whale we love it <laughs> okay um, noted <laughs> noted because you're totally taking direction from me um <laughs> Uh, well, that's really, uh, the, I, you told me what's coming next already, which is, I usually kind of close out with, um, 
And then the last question is, um, is there another mountain you want to climb? Like you've achieved so much, and clearly you've got a lot of career ahead of you. Um, is there something you know you want to do in your life? It could be a creative pursuit, could have, but it could be also something very different from creative that just kind of gives us a peek into Brittany. Um, well, I mean, those graphic novels keep knocking at the door, but uh, I would love to just, yeah, to, to really be able to expand on that whole universe and write the whole story. And I want to do it for Demons of the Astro Waste as well, because there's so many details in my head that you cannot put into music. Uh, you, you, it just, you know, you, you got to sacrifice details sometimes for, po you know, poet, poetry and, and, yeah. and melody and that kind of thing. So, um, it's really difficult to get, you know, specific. So, um, that's just kind of like the biggest thing for me is to finally get everything that's up here, um, down on paper so that everyone can, can read it and see everything the way I see it, which is why I wanted to do it as a graphic novel so that I can really kind of lay it out there for people. And I'm sure that'll probably destroy a lot of people's imaginations with how they've uh, kind of thought of things, but sorry. No, <laughs> those I, of you that... I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, when you, when you are so careful in the construction of a world that you want to sing about and your, your comment there is really an astute one. There, there's a lot of records where this kind of thoughtfulness in the backstory is created. The, you know, someone like yourself that creates it, but it's impossible to convey that kind of thing, um, even in a concept album that might go two hours. Yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, I, man, I hope you find some time to to do that. I mean, that's uh, one of the guys I've had on the show is Arian, and he's made a career out of doing narrative that exists in worlds across, you know, dozens of records. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, uh, like. Find some time. Well, you know, here I am giving you direction again. You do, you do, what, you do what you want to do. But I think it, it, people would love to hear those details, and um, so we'll look forward to that. Um, that's you. all I had for you. Uh, I I so appreciate you taking some time uh, of your evening to talk to me. No worries. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Let me um, stick on the line so I can say a personal goodbye. If that's okay, I'll play the outro, yep. and then we'll be we'll be done. Sounds good. <laughs> 